One of the better weekends we've had in a while around here uh, for our program. Uh, had so many great alumni in town this weekend, which is great to see and, and continue to meet all of them uh, and see a lot of them for, for the second, third, and fourth time. Um, obviously, we played great baseball all week. We had great crowds. Uh, and it was South Carolina versus LSU. So uh, as Coach Tanner said to me in the tunnel afterwards, uh, that's why you're here, uh, to experience stuff like that. And so I agreed 100% with him. Carolina coach Mark Kingston after one of the best weekends, like you mentioned, of Gamecock baseball, uh, certainly that we've seen in a while. 30-10, to 10, the final aggregate score, the Gamecocks over LSU, including quite the comeback yesterday, down 6 nothing. We've heard the that before. We've seen a Carolina comeback down 6 nothing on a Sunday before, but we've never seen it. We haven't seen it result in a win in a series win, in a series sweep against LSU at home for the first time, beating a ranked opponent for the first time in a couple of years. Quite the the weekend for Carolina baseball really changes the conversation now. Uh, Kendall Rogers, a national college baseball writer, saying that that the Gamecocks are back in the mix for the NCAA tournament. Is that how you're seeing things as well, Bill? Well, it is. They're, uh, man, what a weird team season just where this program is at right now because our our key word really last week all week has been consistency well they're good enough to wallop florida good enough to beat clemson good enough to beat arkansas on the road they're bad enough to lose to pc and citadel and Furman and consistency and all of a sudden uh it clicked whatever whatever it was whatever was in that dugout or in that locker room or for at least three days it completely clicked now does it translate over the remaining, what, four series, I believe, three series of the four series, four series, I guess, final 12 games of SEC play along with midweek games? That's going to be the fascinating thing. It, I think, maybe re-energizes the fan base. As he mentioned, good crowds there all weekend. Maybe the fan base now goes, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna invest a little bit more. I'm going to pay attention to you because, Again, I, there's nobody that we've spoke to on our program that's rational that says, yeah, this team needs to make the College World Series or else that Mark Kingston is a failure. But I think there's a lot of people who said, okay, they need to at least get to the postseason in year one. That's where this program standard should be at its absolute lowest. And even with a new coach, postseason play is is the minimal um, standard. And so all of a sudden, you're right. They're they're back there. They're, I think, a game out of second place, if I'm right, and, and overall – not just in the Eastern Conference, in the Eastern Division, but I believe overall, um, we know how tough the SEC is as a whole. So uh, it's a it's an interesting time. And again, I'll go back. They start one and five in conference play, and since that one and five start, they're now eight and four. And so <laughs> you just you've got these good things that are happening, and you've got the weird PC loss. Can they keep the momentum going? Yeah, Carolina now nine and nine in conference play. One game back of Georgia and Vandy in for second place there, or second and third, I guess, technically. The Gamecocks sit in fourth place right now in the division standings. And over in the West now, uh, Ole Miss and Arkansas, also a game ahead of Carolina, and nobody else is. LSU just fell to 9-9. Nine and nine. I mean, they, I think where LSU, the story of LSU this weekend, is really a good example of what the SEC is this weekend. So they're a ranked team in the top 20. They come in in second place in the SEC West. They get absolutely swept by a team that hasn't um, that was towards the bottom of the standings just overall in the SEC. And now LSU finds itself down on the list in a tie for third there in the SEC West, but just one game out of sixth place when you're talking about seven teams uh, in the SEC West. And uh, they're going to be in a, in a fight just to make the, the NCAA tournament themselves at this point. And, and that's what late April, early May is in college baseball when you're talking about a bunch of teams that are on the cusp. They could make a run and be a solid two seed, maybe even make a a run to host a regional, a top 16 type seed, or they could fall out of contention. We've seen it go both ways uh, for Carolina baseball over the years and, and clearly as positive a weekend as you could imagine in a lot of ways. I mean, Mark Kingston probably summed it up best on Friday night went from their worst performance of the year, Tuesday night, losing to Presbyterian, and then their best performance, an 11 nothing shutout, an absolute uh, beatdown, and then 
Not just that, but then they backed it up the rest right. of the weekend. They score a bunch of runs to start the game on Saturday and cruise to another big win there. And then yesterday's comeback was uh, fantastic, filled with a bunch of highlights. Defensively, Justin Rowe started it, and then he hits a home run late in the game. Uh, chest high, I think, is being uh, about as conservative of an es- estimate as you can get after the game. Mark Case is saying hey, he put the runner at first on uh, in motion on a full count, and I think Rowe just saw a pitch that he could get the bat on and happened to lift it up into the air in left field, and it kept going and going. That tied the game up at six, I think, at that point. And then the Gamecocks get a couple of more off a big hit from Noah Campbell to take the lead. Eight straight runs yesterday gives them the weekend sweep against LSU. Puts them at 23-17 and 17 overall, 9-9 nine and nine in conference play. Headed to Greenville to take on Furman midweek this week, then to Vanderbilt this weekend. So the it doesn't get a, a lot easier but that's what SEC baseball is. Vanderbilt, very similar numbers to the Gamecocks at this point. They're one game better in uh, both regular season overall and in the conference standings headed in. Well, but you and I have discussed that. We've kind of continued to say that as poorly as this team has played at times. If you look down the schedule and you saw LSU and you saw Vanderbilt, you see Texas A&M still looming out there. Uh, even a Missouri team has got a pretty high RPI. If the team pieced together wins because of how strong the remainder of the schedule was, NCAA tournament play was not off the table. Well, when you sweep a series like that, all of a sudden it's completely on the table. Now, to my knowledge, nobody is projecting them in the field of 64 just yet. They need, they have more work to do. But certainly, if you were looking for a glimmer of hope, if you were looking for something to latch on to and say, okay, this was the right decision, here was your weekend. Mark Kingston goes out and I think pushes a lot of the right buttons. His team plays a determined brand of baseball. I know I'm seeing on Twitter – and I guess maybe this is just when they win, but people going, that's the South Carolina team that we grow to know and love and pull for, and certainly the the effort they give. How much of it was alumni being back around the ballpark, bringing all those people in? We talked with Brian and Trey about that last Thursday, and again, some of it, I don't want to say we questioned, because I don't know if we do that, but we wondered about the heart and the fight of this baseball team coming off of that loss to PC, and was that it? Was that was that it? Then you bring the caretakers, the former players around the the current players and how do the current players kind of respond to the former players or the former players say look this is how we did and you need to pick it up I mean we kind of saw this with basketball Sandarius Thornwell Dwayne Notice Justin Mackey all those players come back from last year and what do you end up getting the best performance of the season from the South Carolina basketball team probably that was you'd say that Auburn game they're out 37 mm-hmm. to 11 and you get all those those former players come back in this weekend, you get the former players back around. You get some pride in the program, pride, and all of a sudden, you get the best performance of the weekend. You mentioned the the RPI right now. As I look at WarrenNolan.com, the Gamecocks at 59 in the country. LSU just one spot better at 58. Uh, that's up a solid 15 spots. I think we were talking about there in the 70s after that loss to PC on Tuesday night. So still work to be done for sure, but in the conversation for sure now as well. Gamecock baseball with a huge weekend. They got some guys back in the lineup as well. TJ Hopkins most notably at the top of the lineup and uh, helped produce. And uh, mentioned Noah Campbell coming out of it with a big hit that gave the Gamecocks the, the lead and eventually the win yesterday. He, he battled back from a slump over the weekend. Another huge start for Logan Chapman to start the series, the freshman uh, it looks like he's going to be their their game number one guy and try to set the tone. He's done it in two straight uh, starts against as about about as good a competition as you can at Arkansas and then against LSU at home. Throw in the North Carolina game. Now, he was good. He yeah. was good in that one. I mean, Logan Chapman is all of a sudden becoming a re- revelation for this baseball team in terms of a guy you can count on and solidify that uh, that rotation from Friday through Sunday, Cody Morris. Not his best performance yesterday, but he's been pretty stable all year. Adam Hill, obviously, with a pretty good performance on Saturday. Six shutout innings, yeah, that's solid. We'll we'll see. We'll see. Is again is as this team, the the games are there. You've got Vanderbilt this weekend, I believe it's Missouri, then Texas A and M, and or Miss. I know I think Mississippi's in there as well. Is your final four series of the season? The games, the opportunities are there. Can South Carolina take advantage of them? continue to stay hot and and use this as a springboard to something bigger and better kevin hit us up on the shepherd's glass inbox yesterday with the hashtag gamecock larry is going to be on fire tomorrow morning we walked in this morning who's waiting for us on the love chevrolet phone lines our favorite 83 year old caller 
Gamecock Larry on the Love Chevrolet phone lines this morning, 803-404-6100. How you feeling this morning, sir? I'm feeling great. I'm not on fire, but I'm getting money out. Oh, we're going to be okay. I told you, I have made no prediction, but I told them on the afternoon show last Friday, we're going to feel a whole lot better this Monday morning than we did last Monday morning. I still don't understand how we lost them two games to Arkansas. We should have swapped them, but I'm on that path. But boy, I tell you what, I, I went to bed and woke up 1 o'clock Saturday morning and checked my tablet the same way they won, loving or nothing. And I said, I'm going to have to figure out how to get this tablet to work in the morning. So I got my daughter. They told me I could get on Gamecock, Lime, some dot dash, and all that. I don't understand all that, but she got it. And I got to listen to them on Saturday and Sunday. Well, that game yesterday, I tell you, it, it, yeah, you don't know this old boy feels good. But I go Gamecocks. We're going to be okay. We're going to Nashville next weekend. And like I say, I believe we're going to, no, I ain't going to make no prediction, but we're going to. We're going to be okay. Go Gamecocks. Nice talking to you. And I'll see you this weekend. Go Gamecock. Gamecock Larry. Got it tuned in to Gamecock Online dash dot something. Got it worked out. Well done. The tablet is up and rolling. What are you What are you and Gamecock Larry doing? He said he'll see you this weekend. I, well, we're yes. obviously we're road tripping to Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Just the usual. Usual SEC I like how he didn't schedule. double down. That's a safe play right there. I thought for sure he'd double down and say we're hot. There was some caution sweeps. in that day. All of a sudden, halfway through, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll just we'll be all right. I mean, twelve SEC games. He didn't predict twelve and zero. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's been around. Okay, been around a few years. He knows. He knows. You can't you can't just go around predicting sweeps every weekend. You only can pull that one out of the bag every so often. Whew, impressive. It, it, you mentioned it earlier, and. uh Albert hit me up yesterday just with this team is so confusing. Yeah. And that's been the difficult part of the conversation this year in is being really accurate, I think, is the right word. Because accurate includes blowouts against some of the best teams in the country. Absolutely crushing. The, probably the Kentucky series might be the best, right? You get whipped 15 to 1 on a Friday night. Absolutely unacceptable. You turn right around and win 14 to 1 on a Saturday against a top 10 team, right? it's mind-boggling. And then Kentucky was good enough to, to win a, a game three there. That one that was at home. Arkansas, you throw a, guy, a freshman who's never started an SEC game and you win a really intense game three to two by a run to start the series and you get a couple of seven-inning games and a doubleheader on the day you're leaving there to try to steal a series and you can't score a run. You get one runner to third base. Make you scratch your head. You can't beat Presbyterian, a team that went into your ballpark with a 275 RPI, and then you turn around. I mean, you score four runs against PC on Tuesday night, and then you score 11 right. against LSU on Friday. Uh, we'll, we'll let you hear Mark Kingston's explanation as we move on this morning, but it's basically saying that they had a, a eight-game road swing. They got out of their routine of training, like how they like to train with – um, a, a pitching machine, particularly where you have a bunch of the the technology, the swings got too long. You get to shorten those things up, and that well, that that worked really well for two games. Then we saw LSU's game three starter yesterday, Bush, really shut things down. But once Carolina got to the bullpen, they figured it out real quick. They got some momentum on their side, and Eddie Demurius comes in, who hadn't pitched all weekend because. Uh, the big big leads, he had been unnecessary. He throws a solid four innings to keep Carolina in the ballgame. Sawyer Bridges now apparently is the guy. He pitches more than once on a weekend for the first time. Is fantastic. And now we sit here in a completely different situation. I feel like we, we tell this to our Gamecock baseball grades, Brian, Jeff Code, and Trey Dyson, every time they come in on a Thursday morning weekly in the season, like, well, the conversation's almost completely different yeah. than it was last week. And I, I don't know if I've ever seen it kind of roller coaster like this here in the last two decades of following Gamecock baseball. It, it has. And, and look, I think there's nobody out there who would be shocked if South Carolina went to Vanderbilt and got swept. And I also don't think there'd be anybody that's completely shocked if South Carolina goes to Vanderbilt and wins the series. I, you know, it, it's one of those things where you right now with this baseball team and 
it, it maybe some of it is i think we we uh we don't simplify it enough it is the transition of one coaching staff to another coaching staff and everything that goes in that's you don't always get instant success and there are some different philosophies we talked about schemes uh last week i think what was it coming off of the arkansas series people or maybe the pc game Tuesday, I believe Wednesday, somebody was. We had some people tweeting in, going, "We well, just got to get guys in to match his scheme." I don't know if it's that, but maybe it's different philosophies. You talk about right there, Mark King's talk about the training and you know the the different philosophy. I don't know if players necessarily match a scheme, but maybe it's just a philosophy. But South Carolina right now, again, they exit this weekend, and you for a team who's been as up as down, you can't be in a better place. I mean, as up and down as they've been, some of the losses they've had. You know, if you could get back a few of those, you'd feel really good about postseason play, but you can't. You have to go out and you have to make sure they don't happen again. We'll find out again. That That's why the Furman game. There's nobody. I think there's nobody that's listening this morning, listening right now, who will sit here and call in and go, yep, well, except for Game Cochlear, and even he backed off of that a little bit. Who would say, yep, they're going to go beat Furman on Tuesday night in Greenville or Wednesday night, whatever. I forget, Tuesday or Wednesday. But there's nobody. It's just the team is, we'll see how they perform over the next four games now. The difference may be that this team – is a lot healthier than it has been. Has a, a lot of key bats back in the lineup. The sweep and obviously how you, how you won today. Do you feel like this could be a turning point for this team? Well, it's always about the next game. Uh, this was a great weekend. Um, we got a reality check on Tuesday, and we responded the way you want a, a team and a program to respond. Um, but now it's it's on to the next game. We need to do a, a good job on Tuesday um, because that's been a, a cause for concern this year. Uh, and then it's on to the next weekend. So we're going to enjoy this weekend because it was I think it was very important for us to have this kind of success against such a great program like LSU. Uh, but now uh, once once that settles in, it's it's on to the next game. And that next game tomorrow night up in Greenville, taking on a Furman team who came to Columbia earlier this year and beat the Gamecocks. Furman with an RPI just within 100 at 19 and 21 overall on the season. After the midweek game, they'll head to the Gamecocks head to Vanderbilt this weekend. And Vandy, very representative of a lot of SEC programs right now, sitting at 10 and 8 in conference play, 24 and 16 overall. Georgia, Vandy, Ole Miss, Arkansas, all 10-8 and eight on the season. Just one game ahead of Carolina in the SEC standings. Florida on top at 14-4, and four, so it looks like they're going to cruise to another SEC championship. But Carolina right in the mix to finish second overall this year. Uh, the Gamecocks, Texas A&M, Auburn, LSU, all sitting at 9-9 nine and nine in conference play. A couple of SEC East teams, one game behind the Gamecocks in Missouri and Kentucky, Mississippi State also 8-10 and 10 in conference play. Uh, quite the log jam in the SEC standings that will be worked out here in the last four weekends of the season. The Gamecocks, so at Vandy, then back at home against Ole Miss, Missouri, then at Texas A&M to finish this season. That's where we sit for Gamecock baseball right now. That's why we're asking you, do you think the Gamecocks are going to get in the NCAA tournament? That's the Frank's discount tire poll question. Emery weighing in with a response. He says, I voted yes because I believe they'll win their way in. Not that I believe they've done so at this point. Healthy Gamecocks are hard to beat. Kingston is doing his part. Certainly, uh, there's nothing to complain about from a coaching standpoint. I don't think this weekend, seemingly everything that uh, Mark Kingston ended up doing worked for Carolina, especially this huge adjustment of putting the freshman Logan Chapman as the number one starter. We've seen really work out well in the only two SEC starts. The Gamecocks have won those ball games, and then it really set the tone, Kingston said in yesterday's press conference, kind of summing up the weekend where the Gamecocks went 16 and a third innings not giving up a run to start this series against LSU. Right now, though, almost 150 votes in on our poll question, 58% of you going with no. So still unconvinced, and I think a large part of that is due to the 5-6 and six record the Gamecocks have against in-state opponents this year, knowing that there's three of those games still left on the schedule starting tomorrow at Furman. You also will take on the College of Charleston here at Spirit Communications Park, uh, and then you'll play USC Upstate the last three non-conference games, Bill. Told you this uh, last weekend. Felt like the ball was being passed. Logan Chapman taking over that Friday night starter. Adam Hill. No, no, no. That's all I tried to tell you. Logan Chapman. Well, Adam Hill going six scoreless on Saturday. Certainly a, another big part of the Gamecock success over the weekend. And, and to have that guy mm-hmm. coming on in, as your second guy is really um, quite the addition. It really changes the complexion of a weekend, I think. Yeah. Because you feel like otherwise, if you got past Adam Hill, 
or even you lose that game, you're looking at a different set of uh, pitching challenges from an SEC opponent standpoint. But now that he's that second guy, you got to take on that guy in game number two. Good luck. Well, I think, you know, we knew, we kind of felt that, knew that going in because of the inexperience. You were hoping Cody Morris would step up. And by and large, Cody Morris has been very good this year, maybe the most consistent of anybody on the staff, although the way Chapman's pitched the last three outings, uh, he can make that case. But uh, you're starting to see that solidified. And it goes back to the question I kind of asked next year because part of what we're seeing this year uh, is also how does this team set up for the future? What's the what's the future of this team with Mark Kingston? How quickly does this program return to being national title contender, to nationally elite? Because that's where South Carolina baseball is. It's not good enough to just be hosting regionals and playing in super regionals. People around here want a nationally elite baseball program. So with that in mind, you, there's always that eye on the future. We talked about it with Adam Hill. I don't know what Adam Hill's draft status will necessarily be. Certainly you keep throwing games like you did on Saturday. Here's how I would define that as my expert official analysis would be. See ya. Okay. I, I, have, I mean, I'm okay. Uh, a plus plus arm, uh, a, a pitcher, a starter. Uh, there are only so many innings that you have in your arm. He's already had right. some tendonitis concern well, with but his I, shoulder this year. That's what I wonder year. about the injury. You know, the injury, I, and I don't know. I, I've, I, I will admit it's it's NFL draft time. It's one of the greatest times of the year. I'm paying attention to that, not the MLB mock drafts and where Adam Hill could go. But you know, again, you should get Cody Morris back, Logan Chapman. I think you feel good about a guy maybe like Gil Reith or some of the other guys you've had throwing. Maybe Ridge Chapman with another year of development. Now, saw your ridges from what you've seen there. The sophomores looked really good. So I know you lose a lot next year in terms of fielding uh, or in positional players. Mm-hmm. But again, I it's a very interesting time for South Carolina baseball because certainly the the focus is on the present, the here and now. How do they get to postseason play? But I think for a lot of fans also, you're looking with an eye towards the future going, okay, when do we get being back to being nationally elite? Because just getting to the postseason will do for this year, but it won't do for year two and year three and year four and going forward. Well, so, I think uh, if you're looking for signs about what's going to come, um, you look at Mark Kingston's last stop in South Florida and where he took that program and now where it is without him as well with his, his pitching coach taking over, and they sit at 21 uh, from an RPI standpoint, having a good weekend, 26 and 14 overall makes you know that they have uh, talented players who were recruited by Mark Kingston, and and that's where that program certainly very solid footing at this point. Let's talk some Gamecock football. Over the weekend, they get a commitment as well for a 2020 class offensive lineman. Is that what we're talking about here? Well, that's right. And football recruiting is obviously moving up, and and the timetable moving up as well. But Tyshawn Wanamaker, a six four, 320 pound offensive guard out of Calhoun County, a place that's obviously been pretty good to South Carolina so far. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So he's he's now a high school junior, is that correct? If he's a 2020 signee, right? He'll have his Correct. He's a rising, season. he's a sophomore right now. He whoa. is a rising whoa. junior. 6'4", 320, sophomore. Yeah, they're, they're, what you're telling me? They're building him a little bit differently now than when you and I came up. He's, no, there were still some big dudes back then, but that that is... Uh, that's impressive. Yeah, six four three twenty again uh, out of out of Calhoun County, South Carolina having the Spurs up cookout this weekend. One of their cookouts, they'll do multiple events of this. What I thought was interesting, and you know the recruiting nerd, recruiting geek, recruiting dork, whatever you like to reference me as. I don't know if you saw this. They put pictures up, and this is just where I still think South Carolina's coaching staff kind of it's. I should not be surprised by this, but it it felt like under Steve Spurrier, as good as the wins were. There were aspects of the program that were still stuck in the Stone Age. Some of it was how they did recruiting. So I don't know if you saw this. This goes back to a conversation we had with John and Claudia last Thursday, Mm -hmm. I believe, in the student section. One of the big things they did this past weekend, they did it down at 650 Lincoln Street, where they have the dorms and they got a pool and everything. They had, uh, I say a huge, but it's not one that you'd put in your house. They had like a giant screen TV set up. It was you know, I don't know, two hundred. I, I don't. Not it wasn't your. It wasn't a seventy inch. It was something much bigger. It was on like a something like you'd see like on a, a billboard or something. The the game Fortnite players could go out there and or the recruits could go play Fortnite, whatever this is, which I thought was odd because I would think you'd have Madden or something, but whatever. Apparently, this Fortnite game is very Pong. popular. But Pong, yeah, sure. Uh, what was it? What was the, the little guy who jumped around too? The little guy who jumped Cubic, around? Cubic, or what was it? What was <laughs> okay. the game? Cubert? Cubert. Yeah, I never played that one. I was like, is that Mario? Uh, That's a lot of the guy. Yeah, Mario was jumped great. around. 
but I, but no, they so I saw some pictures of that. They had it set up uh, with that large screen, so some of these athletes could come around. Some of these recruits could come around and play that. They had a scavenger hunt uh, where they put them on golf courses. It's actually a unique way of trying to get them to tour the campus. You do a scavenger hunt and they go around and see the campus. But South Carolina picks up one commitment this weekend from Tyshawn Wanamaker, the big name that was on campus, Zach Pickens out of T.L. Hanna, the five-star defensive lineman who's basically down to South Carolina, Clemson, or Georgia. A lot of people think South Carolina leads. He was on campus this weekend with his mom and uh, is considered a top 40, top 30 prospect, depending on where you look at, and certainly is a guy who would help solidify the defensive line. One other recruiting note from the weekend, ESPN uh, releasing, updating after a series of camps, updating their rankings. Ryan Holinsky, the South Carolina quarterback commitment, who took his – official visit to South Carolina this weekend committing just a couple weeks ago he's a currently he's in this class and will enroll early from California ESPN now ranking him the 34th best prospect overall and he had a good uh, good game over the weekend or well they go to the camps Tim they go to you know you 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 non-recruiting guys are such dorks <laughs> when you you ask your questions I love how recruiting rankings shift in April well, you, you got you go to camps and things kind of evolve and change. Plus, you get more film in. I mean, the numbers he put up last year at Orange Lutheran were really good. And maybe he should. He's going to play up. in the Under Armour All American game. I'm not, I'm not trying to yeah. knock the kid. I'm just knocking the the system, the system, and how it works. Uh, but Helensky now the number two overall rated quarterback in America by ESP, and uh, the only guy ahead of him uh, is at 22. Spencer Rattler out of Phoenix, Arizona, who's committed uh, to Oklahoma. But Holinsky, the number two quarterback now nationally uh, on the ESPN 300, so I'm sure he'll be slated to move up there. But he is number 34 overall. But a good weekend for the Gamecocks. They land an in-state offensive lineman as Eric Wolford continues to kind of rebuild. And they'll need to. Uh, this year when you lose Dennis Daly, of course, again, Tyshawn Wanamaker won't be there next year. So, uh, But when you lose Dennis Daly, when you lose Zach Bailey, but maybe Donnell Stanley, who who will have a senior year left, but uh, could leave after next year. You leave multiple guys; they'll need to replace a lot of offensive linemen. That's why you see him taking so many so many linemen in the last two classes. Well, also, so you mentioned Helensky. He's a quarterback from California, highly highly touted. And you mentioned this kid from Calhoun County, Wanamaker, on the opposite end of the spectrum, just down the street, and had not gotten a ton of offers or heavily recruited. But again, Will Muschamp never he says he never pays attention to any of that stuff. And Eric Wolford coming out recently and saying that it's important for the Gamecock program to get in early on younger guys. That's exactly what they're doing here, clearly. And so you have both ends of the spectrum showing you kind of the entire spectrum of what Will Muschamp wants to do at South Carolina. He wants to get the top-notch blue-chip guys from out of the area for sure, and that's what Helensky seems to be on paper, no right. doubt. And then also you got to make sure that you, you have local guys and you can get in early on guys who want to make those commitments early on. Well, it goes back, and I, I said this um, filling in on Heath's show the day after Helensky committed or whatever. I, we don't know how good Ryan Helensky will be. We really, yeah, who knows? Maybe he comes here and maybe well, he's. Well, you're a recruiting guy. Well, no, let me. Let Every me go, recruiting let me, guy knows exactly. Let me, let me, maybe he comes here and he's Connor Shaw. Three right. star, wasn't Elite 11, and maybe he, he, he turned out. Maybe he comes here and he's Keith Matkins. Everybody remember Keith Matkins? I mean, like, played, I think, four snaps. And so you don't you know. You can go even further. I mean, Connor Mitch was a really highly Connor touted Mitch guy. Connor right? yeah. But whoever, you know, we don't know when Ryan Helensky, the football player, gets on. But what it's important for is perception. And. You've got a quarterback who now is going to, you know, again, the other rankings will update, and so you'll be able to use rivals and 24-7 sports or whatever. But ESPN right now, again, updating theirs, and he's now the 34th, 34th best prospect. Not best quarterback, 34th best prospect overall, the number two quarterback in the country, regardless of whether you're a pocket passer or dual threat. He's the number two quarterback. And other recruits take notice and go, wait, why is he going? Why is he coming all the way from California to South Carolina? Why is he coming across what is it especially given the history of Will Muschamp's offense I mean the other other recruits it's a perception thing that's why landing a kid like that for South Carolina was so important so big I mean a guy like Deshaun Watson changing the perception of the Clemson quarterback position which allows a guy like say Trevor Lawrence to go well if he does that I'd like to go there and you draw other big time players Will Muschamp landing uh, and Brian McClendon and Dan Werner landing Orion Holinsky changes the perception, and it causes other players, not just in the 2019 class, but the 2020 class, to go, well, wait, why is a guy that good going there? Well, now let me at least go check out South Carolina. Let me, And that's where South Carolina kind of is 
I think getting ahead of the curve with Will Muschamp, being able to get guys on campus just like they did this weekend, show them the campus, show them the city, show them the new football facility. I was over there the other day, and it the the building itself, I mean, you talk about moving light years into the future. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see the development around williams Bryce Stadium as it's still kind of an industrial area, but you see it transforming with – the, the the transformation with some more student apartment complexes going up. I saw there was some more places for sale down there. And what Will Muschamp can sell is the football environment around williams Bryce Stadium. And this is a, a recruiting staff, again, you give them some wins and you give them some momentum, they'll go out and I, I think it's a, it's a good position. I think the problem here is that your two biggest rivals – one of them just won the national championship two years ago. The other played for it last year. And so there's a perception that South Carolina is still light years behind those those teams. I don't know if they're light years behind them, but certainly the the just talking about the perception of Ryan Helensky, the perception of where South Carolina's football program is, I think can be a little skewed because your two biggest rivals right now are at the top of their game. I get seeing it that way. I think in big picture, though, you could eventually see it the other way where that is a, a driving force. Oh, it is. And just like Steve Spurrier's five-game winning streak over Clemson certainly um, helped give them a constant reality check or helped the push to raise a bunch of money in their facilities and all of that, I think you could see that a uh, very similar type challenge where Will Muschamp and company are right now. And eventually you could look down uh, a decade out or plus and say, well, that actually helped Carolina in the long run to improve and, and strive and go to the next level. We'll see. Of course, obviously, we, we got no idea how it will play out, but it, it could end up doing that, almost have a, a counterintuitive reverse effect sure. in the big picture. Jen, who is this character, this IndyCar guy? James Hinchcliffe. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's been um, part of the IndyCar series for several years, mm-hmm. you know, from Canada originally. He was on Dancing with the Stars about a year and a half ago, came in second. Good driver. He's a good driver, mm-hmm. and he had a really bad wreck back in 2015. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of coverage after that, you know, kind of following his progress and rebuilding. Mm-hmm. Good dancer too. Mm-hmm. Good driver, good dancer. Yeah, what, what's his go-to dance? Salsa. Sometimes a tango. Mm-hmm. Just depends. Depends on his partner. Guy's really good. Just yeah. incredible indie driver. Really, I mean, the stuff he's been doing of late is phenomenal. Just to be clear, I'm <laughs> the guy that you make fun of for knowing anything about Dancing with the Stars, and you just broke down. Tango and salsa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talented. This guy. All-around well, athlete. Uh, I like his He's personality. Kind of the Ben yeah. Simmons of IndyCar. What? Mm-hmm. Well, where? Why? Oh, I'm sorry. This is why I start, I wanted to talk to Jen about this. Thank you. Jen, can you Bye-bye. let us hear what Mr. Hinchcliffe had to say this past weekend? Yesterday, I believe. Well, I was sitting there during that first red, and I was begging to get just three minutes. It's all you need. Three minutes, wheel off to wheel on. And when we got going again... I was, my legs were shaking. I had to go so bad. I'm like, I can't drive a race car like this. So under caution, it took me a full lap. It was one of, one of the least comfortable experiences of my entire life. But I can officially say I've joined the likes of Will Power and Dario Franchitti and other greats that have peed themselves in their suit. So you're talking to a man that just wet himself. <laughs> ben Simmons of uh, IndyCar. Maybe not the Ben Simmons. Maybe more of the Ron Artest, Metal World piece. Eh, that's probably a bad analogy, too. First of all, how does this not happen more often? We figure they're sweating a lot of it out, you know, like. Don't they because, have. Don't how they long are, are these are these any car races as long as NASCAR races? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about solid three hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they just had rain delay after rain delay and, you know. That was the that was the red flag issue he was mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah. Hmm. That's got to be uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can be in bad situations sometimes. <laughs> At least if you're on the interstate, you're looking for exit signs, right? right. You know, you can get off. No problem. Just hop off the next exit. Maybe you got to go an extra 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. But fa- sitting there facing hours, no fun. Mm-mm. Did he win? They had to stop the race. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Are they racing again today? I don't know what the plan is. And you call it's yourself the been... expert. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I was traveling yesterday, too, so. Excuses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Anyway, he's a good guy. He's a lot of fun to... He's Cell data not. works while you're traveling as well. Were you driving? I know on Friday there was a discussion about whether you were going to drive or not. Oh, yep. Yep, I drove back yesterday. Oh, yeah. Came back from Nashville. You, and how was the, the visit to the Music City? It was good. It was good. Um, went and saw Tim Allen. Um, How's that? It was really good. It was not for, you know, um, kids. Not family friendly. Mm, no, mm-hmm. no, no. But 
It was pretty darn funny. It was probably about an hour and a half of a stand up routine, and it was it was good. A lot of new stuff, or some of his home improvement stuff. You know, it was it was newer stuff. It, it's uh, it, he was good on home improvement. He was, and like Last Man Standing and whatever. But he went from his childhood to a couple political views to, um, um, any legal his, issues? Did his, you get into that? Uh, just briefly touched on, you know, when he was in prison, but, you know, discussed Wait, the Tim human Allen body. Tim Allen was in prison? Yeah, Come about on, three years. Keep up. His, his advice to kids has always been, don't sell drugs to cops. <laughs> Tim Allen was selling drugs? Good yeah. advice. Good yeah. advice. The guy on Home Improvement? Yeah. I didn't I miss this. Yeah, it was a long, long time ago. You know, apparently that's the thing now. Like, Jeff Dunham was in town to, uh, this weekend. I heard he was really good on Saturday afternoon, but I heard you know, it went kind of down a political road. I guess that's the comedy thing. They did, and he didn't do it for long. Just, okay. you know, just touched on something. Jeff Dunham's typically pretty good as well. So, Tim Allen, huh? Yeah, it was really good. All right, I know what I'll be Googling after this. Tim Allen in prison. I didn't see this coming. No. I did see your final poll results. Will Gamecock Baseball make the NCAA tournament? I didn't see the actual result. Almost 275 votes in. 56% of you going with no, even after the weekend sweep against LSU. Interesting. Mm. 